All right, so welcome back uh, everyone. So today it's my pleasure to welcome back Peter Vilichkovich, who will be continuing our seminar series on, on GNNs. And then today we'll be talking about monoids and time, embracing asynchrony in graph neural networks. Yeah, thank you, uh, Peter. Great. All right, thank you so much, Bumetian, for inviting me and in for the introduction. Uh, so hi, everyone. My name is Peter Velichkovich. I'm a staff researcher at Google DeepMind and an affiliate lecturer at the University of Cambridge. And uh, today I'll be talking to you about uh, some of the most recent uh, lines of research that I've focused myself on. And I think arguably some which uh, might turn out to be to be quite important uh, down the line. One thing that uh, I will just say in, in the beginning, you might notice that uh, my video is switched off and that I'm a bit slow. I apologize. This is uh, because I am still recovering from a cold. So my voice will take a bit of a hit, but uh, uh, hopefully uh, there'll still be some interesting content for us to, for us to discuss today. And uh, you'll bear with me if I'm a little bit slower. I will also mention that I generally uh, appreciate interactive discussion. So uh, if at any point during the talk you want to interrupt or ask a question, just feel free to write something in the chat and uh, I will check it regularly and we can have a discussion uh, in the moment rather than waiting for the end. I have about 70 slides to go through. So it will be, uh, it will be a reasonably uh, long talk content-wise. Okay. So maybe first, let's just set the stage for uh, what we are going to be uh, discussing today so that you are in the right uh, frame of mind for what to expect here. Uh, what we're going to be talking about today is uh, classical computation. And what I mean by classical computation are the kinds of things you might typically find in an undergraduate degree course in uh, computer science. So things like... Uh, uh, algorithms like pathfinding, sorting, searching, dynamic programming, and all the other, not just clever ways to perform computations on data, but also clever ways to organize data into collections. So things like search trees, heaps, and things like that. Now, of course, because the topic uh, of the seminar is deep learning and my research is in deep learning, we will also discuss uh, uh, to a great degree uh, how can we take this computation and capture it with neural networks? So this will be uh, this will be kind of one of the main flavors of what we'll be discussing today. Now, of course, when you present a program like this, one natural question that arises is why? Like, why should we bother to try to capture computation with neural networks? And uh, I feel like there's lots of different ways I've tried to introduce this and motivate this in the past. I feel like maybe the best way to uh, kind of put my cards on the table early on and hopefully completely help you see the situation from my point of view, whether or not you agree with me, is rather than try to justify what do I mean by capturing computation, to explain why do, why do I personally care about this or what do I want to achieve. So the thing that I actually want to achieve is robust reasoning in deep neural networks. And reasoning is really the key word here. Robust, we'll get to what robust means in a second, but let's try to uh, specify the word reasoning and how are we operationalizing it, at least within our team. So one thing that I must stress is that if you ask different people coming from different fields, they will very likely say that reasoning means something completely different. So this here isn't me trying to ascertain a definition for everyone. This is really what we within our team at Google DeepMind have agreed is an operational definition of reasoning so that we have a clear target that we can try to, uh, to go for in our research. So first, for us, reasoning means a, that, there, that there is a robust procedure you're following to solve instances of a problem. And the key word is robust. Now, robust does not mean fully accurate, right? So humans also perform reasoning. And as hopefully you've all uh, experienced, human reasoning is not always fully accurate. We can make mistakes. But that doesn't mean we're not following a robust procedure in our, uh, in our reasoning. Often you might also have incomplete data because that data might just not be available for you. So you can only perform approximate reasoning because you don't have the full problem specification. 
Also, another uh, branch of thinking about reasoning tends to cast it in the framework of symbolic methods. We will talk a fair bit about neurosymbolic uh, learning throughout today's talk, but uh, I'll just stress that uh, for us, a reasoning system does not necessarily need to be symbolic. So you need to have a robust procedure, but it doesn't have to happen in a symbolic space. It could be done even purely inside a high dimensional latent space. So this doesn't have to be a collection of states that you can easily reason about uh, directly as a human. But one thing that is important is that this procedure should be robust in the sense that it behaves consistently across problem instances that you care about. And what this really means is we care about out of distribution generalization because whenever you train a machine learning system, there will be some kind of distribution of data points that your training set will prepare you for. And if you want to claim that you've really understood any reasoning procedures presented within that training set, well, that procedure should then be at least to some extent applicable to inputs that escape the training set distribution. And specifically, uh, this doesn't even mean that you have to robustly solve all auto-distribution instances, even being able to reason about how big errors are you likely to make when you have an auto-distribution input would still be potentially quite interesting. And maybe one nice way to specify this is just in pure layman's terms, if you have a model that truly captures a reasoning concept, for example, a multiplication algorithm, it, like if you claim that that system can reason about multiplication, then it should work equally well no matter what instance of multiplication problems I give you. However, when you look at our current frontier models, and I'm sure some of you have already played with them, you can find that actually they do not extrapolate on multiplication that well. And... This is actually quite an ironic finding, I would say, because modern day transformers, they have hundreds of billions of parameters. They perform at least that many multiplications just to generate a single output token. But still, even though they have all this power at their hands, they cannot reliably multiply three by three digit numbers correctly. And this is the, just the simple accuracy table of how often will uh, Gemini Ultra, which is one of uh, Google DeepMind's fr frontier models, accurately predict the outcome of multiplying two numbers together of a certain size. And I should stress that this is not something that's inherent to Gemini. Actually, uh, there are related published studies for GPT-4 that you can find. So virtually all frontier models in their base form will struggle with this. And you cannot really claim, therefore, that they understand what multiplication really is. And further, this is one thing that's, I guess, a little bit different to how some other groups might approach problems like these. Because, okay, you might accept that out of distribution generalization is what you care about, and then you'll just set out to solve that problem regardless of how practical your solution is. Sometimes a lot of these problems can be solved if you allow yourself exponential complexity, for example. But we would ideally want to do this, in our group at least, in a way that will be scalable to these hundreds of billions of parameter models. So we don't just want to do it for just any kind of research. We want to make sure that we're doing research that has potential to be paralyzed and to be highly. This is roughly what I want. And I often talk to people from different groups, uh, both within the company and externally, about what I want. And depending on which camp you're speaking to, especially the scaling camps so people who believe that scale is everything and scale will get us where we need to go, regardless of uh, what kinds of methods we use, I typically get and two kinds of responses. The first one is like, you can solve your reasoning problem just by gathering more targeted data. And I feel like this is an important point to raise because uh, here is a very nice result that I really, really like that was published as a spotlight at iClear a few years back and which very beautifully elucidates why, at least in my opinion, data alone will not solve this problem. So this paper, from Ilushu and others at MIT, uh, kinds of uh, ReLU MLP networks extrapolate. And they went from feed forward networks all the way to graph neural networks. And what they present is actually a really simple but beautiful geometric argument, which says a ReLU MLP is 
basically a piecewise linear function. So uh, as you move far away enough from the training set, you can't escape it. You're going to be modeling a linear function. And uh, you can see here for these four examples, visually, it's very easy to see. You have your target function in light gray, your training set in blue, and the learned to value MLP in black. And you can see how uh, once you move away sufficiently from the training set, they convert, even if they fit the training set really well, it will converge to this pure linear regime. And at that point, you are hopeless at extrapolation for these kinds of problems. Um, but maybe let's say this particular geometric argument is not particularly complicated to see once you think about it. What is, in my opinion, one of the other really cool contributions of this work is that it also showed that not only will you converge to this fully linear regime, but you they also proved the convergence on how quickly you will converge into this regime as you escape the training set. So basically, uh, they proved that this convergence rate is actually really, really fast. So once you move away even a slight bit from the training set, you will start very quickly to converge into that fully linear regime. And at that point, if your target function is not linear, you have no hopes of extrapolation. Now, of course, this result is only for uh, models that use the ReLU activation and modern uh, architectures like transformers do not really use ReLUs nowadays. So there have been some more recent extensions of this theory to encompass more general frameworks. Uh, I particularly would emphasize the work on causal uh, motivated analysis from Beatrice Bevilacqua and others, and also the work that I've done with Andrew Dudzik uh, at at, uh, at your apps. Of course, so this is the response to the data gathering approach. The second kind of response that you can get is, okay, you have a problem that your model will not behave properly like an algorithm, so just outsource that algorithm, right? So let your model um, call a tool or write some code or something like this, right? So, and then that that will, by default, end the out of distribution issues that the base model discussing what happens when you hook a neural network to a tool, and specifically to discuss in which scenarios is it actually uh, like is it actually a good idea, and when it might have problems. So, for those who are not familiar, the idea of tool use, at least nowadays, is that you take your neural network, apply it on your raw data, and the neural network predicts an input which a tool can use to just run an algorithm and compute a result. Here, uh, for example, the neural network is predicting a uh, weighted graph to run Dijkstra's algorithm. But this can be anything else. This could even code interpretations. So the neural network could predict some arbitrary Python. And then the tool will execute the Python. And this is an idea that was popular in the neurosymbolic community for many, many years. Uh, nowadays, methods like tool formers have vastly popularized it in combination with large language models. And clearly, by definition, the tool will not have problems out of distribution because it's a hard-coded piece of software, right? But in my opinion, if you just say, I'm going to hook this to a tool and it's going to solve all of my problems, it's basically admitting defeat before you even start. Because... If you just decide to use a tool without changing anything about how you build the base neural network, you're basically, first of all, acknowledging your neural network cannot do this, giving yourself fully to whatever, and also communicating to a tool using whatever inputs the tool expects can introduce a bottleneck because it's a brittle connection. If uh, the neural network makes the slightest mistake, the tool doesn't know to correct for these mistakes usually like often algorithms work under very strict preconditions of the input so if you don't give it an input that you expect the algorithm will not care it will give you a solution for that particular input and composing additional tools might also require exhaustive efforts so i would argue based on this analysis of both responses like get more data or hook your model to a tool that we likely need to change the equations of the model to capture the computation better. Like, we, if we want fully competent, be able to get where we want just by uh, 
having me or sticking better computation on top of a model. Before we dive into it, though, we are going to need to cover some preliminaries just so that we're all right. So, before we dive into uh, model equations, let's just talk a little bit about evaluation, which is another thing that's uh, generally quite tricky to handle in a proper way. Because nowadays, as you know, we train these big models on the entirety of the internet, more or less. And as a result, most of our benchmarks have one or another degree of distribution leakage, which makes them quite unsuitable for properly evaluating is the model generalizing in a distribution fashion. So in order to support this kind of work, we need tasks that satisfy some very specific properties. We need to be able to generate outputs, first of all, reliably, so we can verify them, then efficiently, so that uh, it's actually feasible to compute a large amount for any distributed interest. So it's not just something that relies on some distribution we can still label, but rather we can quickly generate new outputs for conditions taken together are synonymous having a efficiently implementable algorithm. And here by efficient, uh, we, uh, I'll typically take to mean polynomial time. So here is one example of a polynomial time algorithm. You can see at the bottom of the slide, it's a standard sorting algorithm insertions, which gradually sorts a list, five, two, four, three, one, towards eventually having a sorted list, one, two, three, four, five. And you can see how it gradually adjusts the links of the list by uh, repeatedly sorting the current element into lists. So, so we took inspiration from this and it led to an effort which lasted for two and a half years, uh, initially only led by me, but eventually joined by several other great collaborators um, to look at, like, if we have this understanding that polynomial time algorithms are the right tool to measure out of distribution generalization, let's collect a benchmark of the most standard uh, uh, theoretical computer science algorithms. For that, we use the Introduction to Algorithms textbook, which is one of the most standard textbooks in undergraduate computer science, very, very popular, commonly used. And uh, if you read through this book, and I've done this as part of preparing for uh, building this benchmark, you can find that even though the book has several thousands of pages, there's only about 90 or so algorithms. From these 90 algorithms, we've selected a set of 30 that were particularly nice to work with. And you can see they cover a wide spectrum of possible algorithmic tactics from sorting to searching to graph algorithms and strings or even geometric algorithms. And one thing that's really interesting about this data set, which we call CLRS as an homage to the authors of the textbook, is that the benchmark is not just a data set. It is a data and baseline generator because we, if you want to measure true out of distribution generalization, it can never be bound to just one particular test set because eventually over time it's going to get saturated. So CLRS 30 really allows you uh, to uh, take for any algorithm you want, any distribution you want, you it will by spanning the algorithm and how its data is collected you can automatically build a data set of any size and the library will take care of all of the batching, all of the gradient descent, all of the encoders, decoders, and loss functions. Effectively, it will build baseline models for you and uh, it has subroutines to train them as well. So basically, you don't have to do a lot of line off the ground once you have an algorithm implemented in there. And uh, this is work that we published at ICML a few years back and uh, the code is available. So if you want to play around with the benchmark, it is public on our GitHub. And I would invite I choose uh, afterwards if you haven't already. It's uh, So the first thing we talked about is data. Like how can we properly take some data that we can use uh, for training and testing our models such that out of distribution generalization is properly evaluated. Now let's talk a little bit about what model classes we are going to be working with. And specifically, 
as uh, was, I guess, we are going to be talking about today are based on these graph neural networks or GNNs. We will discuss later why GNNs are a particularly good choice. But uh, for now, what's really important is that you understand uh, the basic way in which they work. So how it works is we have a graph structure and we have some feature vectors, each of the nodes in our graph. So these are the X vectors. And then uh, uh, what you do at every step of your computation is you first use these message vectors along every edge of your graph uh, that's uh, computed by the message function psi, which takes the features and computes uh, a message vector to be sent across that edge. Once you've calculated all the messages that are going into a particular node, uh, then you need to combine them together, all of your messages in the mailbox into just one vector. And you can do this by using an aggregation function. This is what the big O plus is for. Uh, and this is something that will reduce a bag or multi set of message vectors into just a single message vector. Uh, put differently, from a mathematical perspective, this is the same as choosing a monoid structure on, uh, on the real vectors that your messages are. And as long as you make it commutative, so as long as you make it invariant to the permutations, like taking O plus to be either sum or max or average, this is a valid aggregation function. Once you've aggregated all your messages together, then you just need to use that to update the state of each node. And this is done by using the update function phi. This function here uh, takes into account the previous features of a node, the edges, and that updates the features into some new high dimensional space. And then you can stack lots of layers like this and uh, get hopefully good representations of the nodes of your graph. Now, as you can hopefully see, the psi and the phi are the main parametric parts of this model here. And if you specify their weights, the this is all the learnable parameters you have. So typically, psi and phi will be implemented as some kind of multilayer perceptron, potentially uh, using some activation in the middle, like ReLU. And the uh, parameters of these transformations can be optimized using gradient descent, because this function is fully differentiable in all of its parameters. Now, there's a lot more wonderful things that can be said about GNNs. I've personally worked on these models for a long time, and I really love both writing and talking about them. So while I would love to spend more time in this talk to tell you about them, it's unfortunately not the topic of the talk. So this is where we will stop in terms of GNN content. But if you would like to learn more, if you don't have a GNN background and you would like to learn more, here are two resources that I've authored that I would highly recommend you check out. The one on the left, Everything is Connected, is a review paper which outlines uh, of the arguments I usually give for why GNNs are really generic and useful and powerful. And on the right-hand side, you have my talk on theoretical foundations of GNNs that I gave at Cambridge a few years years back, and uh, it's publicly available on YouTube and has already accumulated about 80,000 views. So uh, basically, I think it has the seal of approval from the community at this point, so I'm quite happy with it. But now we will stop talking about this really just to, just to get you comfortable with the notation I'm using and the different terminology I'm going to be using for the different uh, functions. Uh, what we're now going to see is how I try to use these models to capture algorithmic computation better by playing what... Right. So, the main set, why do I call this the alignment game, is we're relying on something known as algorithmic alignment. And algorithmic alignment is something that we can define mathematically. But I feel like <clears throat> it's much easier to first think about it intuitively, right? So here on the left-hand side, we have a standard algorithm for finding shortest paths in a graph, the Bellman-Ford algorithm, which uh, gradually computes distances du of each node to uh, the source vertex. 
by repeatedly iterating the equation on the right-hand side. So you take the minimal possible way of first reaching a neighbor, that's the dv, and then traversing the edge from the neighbor to yourself, that's the w, the weight of the edge from v to u. Now, on the right-hand side of the diagram, we have a message passing neural network. And I've drawn these lines to explain how different parts of the dynamic programming rule of Bellman Ford align with the different parts of the computation of GNNs. Specifically, you can imagine the different distance variables as node features. Uh, you can imagine the process of adding an edge weight as computing a message function. And you can imagine this minimization across all the neighbors as an aggregation function, the O+. Plus. So in a way, you can decompose the equations of your GNN, and they match pretty nicely to steps of the algorithm. And this is what we mean on a high level by algorithmic alignment. And using this, we can actually mathematically formalize why some model, some neural network architecture, might be better for an algorithmic task than another. Here, when I say better, just to make it mathematically concrete, I mean better in terms of sample complexity. How many training examples do you need to achieve a particular amount of generalization error? And this theoretical argument was proven in the seminal paper from Shu and others on what can neural networks reason about. The theorem that these guys prove is that better algorithmic alignment leads to better generalization. And additionally, kind of as outlined by the picture I showed you, graph neural networks are shown to algorithmically align to these dynamic programming algorithms, which, as you might know, uh, are a very generic class of programming strategies which solve a problem by recursively partitioning it into some problems and then assembling the results to compute the final solutions. It's a very generic strategy for solving most problems, and many algorithms can be easily phrased in this kind of terms. And I hope you can see how this idea of partitioning a problem into some problems and so on uh, very nicely corresponds to a graph, because you can imagine each of your subproblems as a node in a graph, and then uh, the act of combining solutions as uh, uh, computing message functions and aggregating them. So this is one of the reasons why we talk about GNNs in this context so much. Basically, uh, they are very well aligned to the kind of algorithmic computation we want to capture already to begin with. Okay. So now that we know that uh, the idea of alignment is one that should be quite powerful, I want to describe you some of the broad ways in which algorithmic alignment can be practically achieved. So basically the kinds of things I do in my day-to-day -day research and that I sometimes get to publish as well that follow this basic principle uh, and achieve better out of distribution generalization. So the first one, which the general class of directions is to just do some modification to your architecture. And sometimes these modifications are fairly obvious when you think about it. So if you know your pathfinding problem uses a minimization operation, then probably you should choose your aggregation function to be something compatible with that, like max. So you shouldn't use sum necessarily, right? So just set the aggregator to max. I have done this in a paper published at iClear 2020. And I need to stress, while this might seem to you like an obvious choice, it was extremely controversial at the time because there were existing theoretical results about GNNs showing that uh, basically some aggregation is maximally expressive and it's more expressive than average and average is more expressive than max. So max was never seen as a particularly powerful or wise choice to use. But now with the theory of linear algorithmic alignment that I showed you a few slides ago, we can actually have a very sound piece of theoretical evidence for why max is such a good idea. But this is one of the things that uh, you can do just by following the theory of alignment. And fun fact, uh, I was involved in a research with uh, a few mathematicians from Oxford and Sydney where we use this exact same recipe, like of changing your architecture to match the equations of a target procedure that you're trying to mimic. 
and this kind of model was very useful in our research with Jordi Williamson on finding structure inside complicated mathematical objects in representation theory, which we were able to publish uh, as well in the journal Nature, where it was on the cover in December of 2021. But also we were able to publish a top tier mathematical paper in the journal Representation Theory, which to me at least was a very massive item off of my bucket list because I've, I went to a mathematical high school uh, as a kid. I've always uh, you know, dreamed of being able to do mathematical research, but I was never particularly that good at math. So this was a very good way to sort of use my machine learning skills to find a sideways entry into the world of math research. So I was very happy about that. Now, one thing that might seem even more obvious than modifying the architecture that you can try to do is to modify the features. So the input feature representation that goes into the model. Now, let's concretize this. Like we told, uh, I mentioned before that at least for ReLU MLPs, you might have a really good time if your target function is linear and otherwise extrapolation is gonna be really hard. So let's look at a classic example of n-body physics or any kind of physics where you have to model forces between objects that tend to follow inverse square laws. So things like electrostatic forces as well. You have to basically your objects are your nodes and you have to predict their movement in future. As you know, forces uh, in physics in such situations follow an inverse square law, which means that uh, they will be uh, proportional to the inverse square of uh, the distance between the objects. So if you put just the raw distance as an edge feature, you can expect the model to struggle to extrapolate because it has to predict now a very nonlinear function in those distances. But if instead you choose to put in your edge features something like uh, the expression in the lower left corner where you uh, feed it actually the inverse square of uh, the distance, well, then you actually are in a better position because now suddenly your force will be a linear function of the feature you put in the edges. And suddenly you're gonna be able to extrapolate much better. These kinds of effects have been spotted in a few papers. Uh, Pete Battaglia's Interaction Networks were one of the first papers to kind of spearhead this line of research and uh, the algorithmic alignment papers uh, kind of tied it all together to the idea of linear algorithmic alignment. The third approach, which I personally also really, really like because it often involves a lot of mathematical creativity and if done well, the final solutions can be really, really elegant, is to constrain the architecture. So what does this mean? This means that uh, basically you find some mathematical property that your algorithm satisfies and then what you do is you put constraints on your neural networks architecture such that they respect the same property. And I feel like this is something that's best exemplified by this ITER GNN paper that was actually a Europe's paper a few years ago. And one of the many things that they're able to do in this paper, it's a really cool paper, is that uh, actually they note that most interesting algorithms, including pathfinding algorithms, are homogenous. And what does this mean? This means that uh, if you were to multiply all parts of your input by a scalar, lambda, you will get exactly the same solution just scaled by lambda. So if you multiply all of your shortest, all of your path lengths in a graph by lambda, the shortest paths will still be the same and their lengths will just multiply by lambda. And these kinds of properties, this is a homogeneity property. So they concluded that they might be able to extrapolate better if they make the graph neural networks modeling a pathfinding algorithm also be a homogeneous function. So what is the part that makes a GNN non-homogeneous, at least if it uses a ReLU MLP? Well, it's the affine term, the bias term in their uh, linear layers, right? So the way in which they make their GNNs conform to this constraint is by just setting the bias vectors to zero. So that's basically the idea of one part of their paper. Just set your bias vectors to zero everywhere. And now suddenly you have an architecture that computes a homogeneous function. And they've been able to 
show that that function will indeed extrapolate better on pathfinding problems and similar kinds of problems that also have the homogeneity property. Another thing you can do is you can change your computation graph. So uh, sometimes it might not be enough to follow the edges you're given in the input. Sometimes if you reorganize your edges, you'll end up in a better situation. Or sometimes you might just choose to take the complete graph and let your model pass over all pairs of nodes and then discover by itself what's the best way to organize information. This has been explored in a several papers. One of our own, the PGN paper, uh, shows how you can teach a model to uh, solve path querying problems better by first learning to predict edges of a disjoint set union data structure, which is known to be quite efficient in these cases, and then use those edges to answer the queries better. So uh, this, is, this was a whirlwind tour of four different ways in which myself and many other researchers have attempted to use the ideas from algorithmic alignment, either explicitly or implicitly, uh, to build models that will generalize better outside of distribution, especially for algorithmic tasks, but generally any kind of problem solving, including physics. So now it is worth for us to take a step back and think a little bit back to our original equation of a GNN. And let's think what are all the things that our approach has attempted to modify so far, right? So uh, one thing that has been modified a lot or mathematically constrained were the parts of the GNN that have parameters. So the psi and the phi definitely saw lots of attention. Then in some cases, I mentioned it might be good to say, your aggregation function to something like max. So we've definitely played with setting the aggregation function too. We also played with features, especially in the physics example. We found that giving the inverse square of the distance might be a good idea. So modifying the features is sometimes done in this field of work. And also sometimes we modify the computation graph over which you're passing messages. So that's changing this neighborhood set U for each node U. So you might wonder, but Petar, now you've highlighted all parts of this equation. So what else is there left to do? Like my talk always implies that there's something else to do, but it looks like I've highlighted everything. Well, there was actually something that is hidden inside this equation and in many other equations, including transformers, but we uh, never, we didn't explicitly write it and often it's not explicitly written. And that is the clock, the time axis. So there's always this subtle assumption that you have input features from a particular time step or layer, and those features are then directly used in computations of the next layer. And it's always a T to T plus one dependency, and all of the messages are sent, received, and processed immediately. So this was always a subtle assumption that there exists a global clock which synchronizes all of these messages. And this is actually what we might want to, to break apart. So what I'm currently betting on and what we're going to discuss for the remainder of the talk is how can we actually, like why it's a good idea and after we agree it's a good idea, why might it be a good, uh, why and how to reconcile graph neural networks and other neural networks like transformers with the ideas of asynchronous. Right, so. As we discussed in the earlier parts of the talk around the beginning, GNNs and transformers tend to struggle quite a bit when you ask them to reason, especially over long trajectories, especially out of distribution. And as we discussed, at least for our operational definition, reasoning requires having some robust procedure for solving problem instances. And one roadblock you get here for long range generalization is that a lot of the cases, the problems you're trying to solve are inherently asynchronous, which means if your problem has a certain amount of variables, only a handful of them can be meaningfully updated at every step. The other variables need to wait or block for other results to become available before they can meaningfully do anything. And this is not a limitation of the fact we chose to align ourselves to algorithms. It's a topological constraint of the problem. You just cannot compute certain parts of it 
until some other parts have finished. But problems are very rarely embarrassingly parallelizable. There's always some degree of blocking or synchrony required. And what happens if you update a node when you should not do it? Well, that's an opportunistic update rule. And while it will fit your training data distribution quite well, it is opportunistic and prone to failures. However, all of our models that we use today are synchronous. They will update all of your node or token states everywhere all the time. And think about what are the kinds of message or update function that a GNN would have to learn to generalize on a problem like this. It's basically identity for a lot of the nodes. And then for some others, you have to learn a highly complex function. So in the very least, it's a kind of complicated if-else switch where the else branch is something trivial like uh, kind of identity and the if branch is really complex function. So I hope you can take my word that this is something that's not trivial at all to learn in a way. Well, you can learn it in a way that generalizes in your training data distribution, but like outside of it, it's tricky. It's tricky to avoid even numerical errors, let alone something else. So naturally, we sought out to try to reconcile GNNs with asynchrony a bit better. And uh, one of the works that we did with Valerie Engelmeyer at LOG last year was just a simple observation of, OK, if GNNs are inherently parallel, let's try to teach them to execute parallel algorithms, whenever that's possible. And this was elegant, scalable, and we could drive some nice theory about it. But obviously, it's not always possible. As I said, not all tasks are embarrassingly parallel. That's just the nature of the task. Concurrently with us, several other groups from ETH and Oxford have attempted to reconcile this problem by implementing an asynchronous model. So a model that will explicitly not send messages everywhere all the time or not aggregate everywhere all the time. So this led, us, uh, this led to two different papers. The first one is the GUAC paper from Lukas Faber and uh, Raj Wattenhofer. The other one is Cooperative GNNs from Ben Fink. Kuhlstein, Michael Bronstein, and others. And in both cases, you have some mechanism where nodes either decide or randomly choose when to send messages, when to listen for messages, and things like that. And these are uh, practically trainable systems that, in principle, will directly solve the problem. And you can prove that they can solve certain problems better. But because of their inherent asynchrony, this is not something you can easily scale up on a GPU or a TPU without wasting a lot of compute. And there's lots of discrete decisions you need to make. So training them in a stable manner is also not easy. So this is not to say that we shouldn't do more research on these models. I think this research is really, really important. It's just that for our immediate aims, these kinds of directions were not applicable. So what's remaining? Well, what's remaining is the work that we have done with uh, Andrew Dudzik, uh, Tamara von Glenn, and Raz van Pashkano, and myself. We have developed techniques that actually keep the GNN synchronous so that they can still be scalable on the modern hardware of today. But we make them so that their computations are provably invariant under various forms of asynchronization. So what this means is that uh, I can decide, say, to randomize the order in which my messages are sent or randomize the order in which the messages are aggregated or you know, anything that might be a blocking point, if I decide to randomize, the provable invariance will guarantee that the final embeddings I get are going to be exactly the same, even if I chose to synchronize. And a model like this will now hit a sweet spot because you'll have the soundness of the original method. You'll have the scalability of the GNN. And it's as you will see, it's actually something that we can feasibly build. Like there are very clear mathematical constraints you can resolve, which result in concrete model implementations that you get from this. So this leads us to what we actually developed. And now I'll tell you a bit more about our work on asynchronous uh, algorithmic. Oh. All right. So the general strategy <clears throat> we're going to assume is that our target algorithms support certain kinds of asynchrony. So like you can update variables in arbitrary order without affecting the results. And our strategy is to describe several levels of such alignments. At each level, we remove some synchronization points that a GNN might have. And 
each removal of a constraint, uh, sorry, each removal of a point will give us a constraint on what the GN equations need to support in order for the final result to stay the same. And if you make your GNN satisfy those constraints, this gives you asynchronous alignment to that particular level. Now, in order to talk about this in a theoretical way, we need to describe several different types of data that are being exchanged by the GNN. You have the set of messages, this is the capital M, the set of states of nodes, capital S, and the set of node arguments A. So the states here are just, you know, the, the vectors stored in each node and they change as a result of receiving messages. And you have node arguments, which are inputs that go into the message function. And uh, they are also triggered as a result of receiving messages. A new argument might be emitted. In practice, you can all, usually always safely assume that the messages, states, and arguments are all just real vectors, and often we'll even set them all to be equally dimensional real vectors. But it's important to keep them separate because there will be different rules derived for the different parts of the data flow. So you, can, you should think of them as separate collections of possible data points. But in reality, in practice, just think this will be implemented as real vectors. Further, we will, uh, in order to make the math tenable, we need to assume some constraints on a few of these uh, types of data. And specifically, messages and arguments, we have to assume that they admit what's called a monoid structure. Now, monoids are, uh, if you're not familiar with them, they're groups without inverses, effectively. So it's a very nice abstraction to study repeated computation. And in fact, you can make exact correspondences between monoid actions and state machines. And what this means in principle is that we actually assume that both messages and arguments can be iteratively assembled during the lifetime of our model, right? The monoid structure allows you to gradually or immediately assemble the parts of messages or arguments as more data becomes available. And I'm personally quite excited about the idea of using monoids to explain different aspects of machine learning uh, architectures better. So much so that for those of you who might be active on, on X or Twitter, uh, I have monoids as part of my uh, biography in this web page. Now, uh, in order to emphasize this monoid structure, we will typically write M and A together with their monoid operation, times and plus, and their monoidal neutral element, one and zero. Now, note that I'm calling this times one and plus zero just to keep M and A distinguished. But if we choose M and A to be the same set, these monoids might also be identical. So don't think that times and plus must be different things. They don't have to be different things here. I'm just denoting them differently uh, so to keep the two monoid structures separate, right? And uh, once you have this in place, you can now talk about what happens when a particular message or aggregated message arrives in a node which has a particular state, so M and S. What happens is you have a new state coming out as a result of acting on the state with the message, and you have a new argument emitted as a result of invoking this delta function of uh, message M on state S. And you can see, just to kind of make things clear, you have the types of both the action dot and the delta. So what we're interested in is what happens when there's multiple messages arriving, because we want to reason about what happens when those messages are processed at the same time versus what happens when they're processed in a random order, right? Because asynchrony would imply that uh, you can either let them act separately or simultaneously or differently, and asynchrony invariance would that mean we'd still get the same output in both of those cases. So the first thing you can do is force your transformations to be so-called monoid actions. And uh, one specific type of monoid action uh, invariance you can get for states are the following rules that you see on the slide. And hopefully... Those rules have very clear interpretations, which I also give at the bottom of the slide. So the first one says that if your state is hit with a neutral message, it doesn't change. And second, when there's two messages, 
you can either choose to aggregate them first and then act on the state, or you can act on the first one of the state and then act on the second one on the transformed state. If those two are the same, then obviously you have a form of asynchrony invariance that you can use. For arguments, it's a bit more complicated picture because as we said, arguments have their own monoid structure with its own plus operation, right? So the first thing you need to have here is that uh, the argument emitted with a neutral message is neutral. So delta one always gives a zero message. Uh, sorry, delta one always gives a zero argument. Uh, and then a delta caused by two messages uh, is the same as the delta given by the first message plus the delta of the second message on the transformed state of the first one. So this is important, right? Because two separate arguments are emitted in the asynchronous case, and you need to make sure that when they're assembled using plus, you'll get exactly the same argument as the one you've started from. Right. So put differently, as you can see at the bottom of the slide, we can either compose two messages and then emit one argument. Or we emit one argument from the first message and we transform the state. Then we emit a second argument using the second message acting on the transformed state. And then we combine those two arguments with plus. The resulting argument needs to be the same. By the way, this particular condition, for those of you with a more mathematical background, it should look familiar. It's known under many names in mathematics, uh, either as one co-cycles or derivations. So they're related to Leibniz, uh, Leibniz's derivation rules or cross homomorphisms because they uh, indicate a relationship between uh, two different uh, monoids. So the last thing that you can talk about is once the arguments get computed, you can then use them to produce new messages. Now, this is also a monoid transformation, but it is a stateless one because we typically assume that edges do not keep persistent state. We assume that all of our state lives in nodes. And if you did want to store state in the edges, the framework would treat that as a node anyway. So here we'll assume just a specific case of a single argument message. So here we assume that say only the sender node computes a message. This can be extended to both sender and receiver or even multiple data sources, but uh, this is just to keep the maths a little bit uh, more elegant. So you have this psi function, which converts your argument into a message to be sent along that edge. And uh, if you want to make this psi a co-cycle, so this is the same rule that you've seen here, but just on a case with no state, you'll end up with a case of uh, neutral argument produces a neutral message. So psi of zero is one. And if you have two different arguments, you can either uh, assemble them together with plus and then emit your message. Or you can uh, produce a message from the first argument, produce a message from the second argument, and then assemble them when they arrive at the receiver node. So if you have this condition satisfied, it's a really powerful condition because it lets you send messages immediately after some other message is received without waiting for all the other messages to arrive. This allows you to mix computation across different layers of your model. There's not even layer-wise synchronization when you have this uh, support. And just to be clear, because I only showed you the rule for single argument messages, if you have multiple arguments in your message function, you can generalize this. But Psi now needs to be not just a monoid homomorphism, it needs to be a monoid multimorphism. So it's a condition we can't satisfy. It just, it's more complicated to write down. So using these rules and talking about how they map to GNNs, we have now been able to uh, map them to an actual model. So let's describe what we actually built. So first of all, this is looking back to the GN equation I showed you before. And I've drew some helpful clocks uh, on this uh, picture to show you which things happen at the same time normally. So all the computations of message vectors happen at the same time in a typical GNN. Then all the aggregations of the messages happen at the same time. And then uh, all the uh, new messages happen at the future time and so on. 
And at the bottom, you also have a diagrammatic representation of how the vectors transform in a typical GNN. And whenever you have a bunch of arrows converging into a single point, this is a blocking point. And a standard GNN will wait for all the data to be available before proceeding to the next step, right? So you need to block on all the messages arriving before aggregating. You need to block on that also before updating. And then you need to wait on the update to finish before calling the message function again to compute a new message, right? So let's talk about the different levels of alignment. First of all, the message monoid in GNNs typically will be k-dimensional real vectors, and uh, the operation will be our aggregator, the O plus that we're using. So sum or max or whatever, and the zero of O plus is whatever the neutral element is for that. So if you want to make the aggregation order irrelevant, so if you want to aggregate the messages however you want, the only thing you need is for this uh, O plus operation to be commutative. And at that point, your messages can be aggregated as soon as they arrive without any synchronization. The cool part is most GNNs already use a commutative monoid for their aggregation function. We also have a, a, a follow-up paper, the LCM paper with you and all, which uh, explores this in more detail and actually shows that uh, you can also learn a model to be nearly commutative as well. So this is level one. Conveniently, most GNNs are here anyway. And when you have that, what it allows you to do in the bottom diagram is basically aggregate messages piecewise as they arrive rather than wait for all of them. But this doesn't actually buy you much because you still have to wait uh, for all the messages to come in before you can invoke phi, the update function. So first, let's describe this level 1.5, which will allow us to invoke phi more liberally as new messages arrive. So our state transformation the dot operator that I told you before. For GNNs, that's the phi function. So it's a phi function on the... And I just repeated the axioms for this to be a valid monoid action, which will turn into an asynchrony constraint, actually. So specifically, what does it mean? If uh, I choose to update state x with whatever is the zero vector uh, for my monoid, I should get just x, uh, no updates to the state. And more importantly, if I update X with a combination of two messages, uh, that should be the same as if I first try an update on the first one and then updated the result of that using the second one. So these two should be the same, right? And there's many ways in which you can satisfy this. In our paper, we went for one very simple approach to show how you can do it. Just set your phi function to be exactly your monoid aggregator and then rely on the associativity of the monoid to uh, satisfy these rules. Now, uh, this isn't quite level two yet, so we need to make one additional jump because as we said, our model also produces arguments and we need to be careful that those arguments are properly emitted. So they need to satisfy this one co-cycle condition that we talked about before. And this is just me repeating the rules for the co-cycle condition here. And uh, now you need to keep track of two different monoids and that one we denoted with O times just to keep it different from the O plus. And you can see on the equation at the bottom, the rule basically repeats itself uh, just in a slightly different form where we use phi instead of uh, the delta function because in basic vanilla GNNs, the uh, argument functions correspond to the node states. Like the inputs to the message function is exactly what's inside the nodes. So whatever comes out of phi. And we actually prove in our paper that under the assumption that message state and argument monoids are the same and the monoid operations are the same, then it's sufficient to make your update idempotent to satisfy this condition. And if you want to combine that with the previous setting of phi equals O plus, you just set phi equals O plus equals max because max is an idempotent uh, operation. Sum, for example, is not idempotent. You cannot apply it multiple times to the same input and get the same result, unless that input is zero. 
So combining all of these things we discovered together, we end up with an equation that's the model on the right. So you have this max max GNN basically where your update function is now just the max and the inner function, the aggregation is also max. And now this allows us way more asynchronous freedom because we can basically uh, aggregate things we can update function things immediately when they arrive. We don't even need to call the aggregator function anymore. But we still need to wait on all the come before I can trigger messages for the next layer or break layer boundaries. Back in these monoid multimorphism conditions, I told you, like if you set your monoids to, so the neutral element here is minus infinity for the, but you can have the second rule that the message of the max of two arguments is the same as the max of the corresponding messages. As long as that's satisfied, you can send your message whatever you want and the idempotence of max will take care of it. And we actually prove that in order to satisfy this, you need to make your psi function a tropical linear layer. Now, what this means is that it's a linear layer like most others. The main difference is that you change what plus and times are. Plus becomes max and times becomes plus. And inside this particular uh, semi-ring, matrix multiplication gives you a valid multimorphism. Now, it's worthy to take a step back and see what does this layer actually do. It's a well-known fact in computer science that you can express shortest pathfinding algorithms as just repeated matrix vector products. If your uh, distance matrix uh, has the node distance, uh, has the pairwise distance between nodes, and your uh, vectors have the current belief of node distances. So basically what you're doing is you can imagine your linear layers as choosing a, a weighted graph in which you want to solve a pathfinding problem. And the node features tell you the initial conditions of uh, that pathfinding problem. And this is quite a neurosymbolic approach because you're literally embedding tiny pathfinders inside, uh, inside your model. However, we haven't been able to practically train this exact architecture because uh, a distance matrix will have quadratically many parameters to learn, but because of the max aggregation, only one value per row will receive gradients. And this is a problem for our learnability. So as a quick fix, we actually don't use max plus. We use log sum x semi-ring, which is a smooth approximation to the max plus. And if you take these constraints together, now you have full asynchrony reached. So the same equation as before, but now additional constraints on psi to be a tropical uh, multilinear function. And now you can send your messages with psi whenever you want. This is a full asynchrony. There's nothing anymore that's blocking anywhere inside this computation. And as you climb the ladder of different uh, GNNs that gradually have more and more constraints like this, you can see that you get better performance generally at out of distribution execution for various algorithms inside CLRS. So these are all test scores on input sizes that are four times bigger than the sizes you're training on. So it's uh, an out of distribution split. And you can see red is level one, green is level two, and blue is sort of level three. As I said, we had to use the log sum x, which is the which is an approximation, a smooth approximation to tropical linear. But you can see how even with that approximation, it yields the most competitive model overall with uh, generally smaller uh, confidence intervals as well. So hopefully <clears throat> this is still like, this is a very fresh work relatively speaking. So it hasn't been out for a very long time, but it already raises a lot of interesting discussion points. So how can we satisfy things like associativity with parametric update functions? So far we had to have update function equal to uh, O plus, which obviously makes it a hard-coded function rather than parametric. What if we don't assume that node states, transformations, and argument emissions, so the psi and the phi and the delta are the same thing? What happens then? You can get lots of interesting behaviors. How can we practically obtain one co-cycle conditions without an idempotent aggregator? How could we learn monoid multimorphisms with SGD in a more scalable way without uh, approximations like the log select? 
logs? Or can we do better approximations than logs and X? We're already exploring several of these. If any of the directions sound interesting to you, uh, please let me know. Happy to collaborate. And if you want to know more, I'll just give you a few pointers if you're interested. Uh, there's a lot of stuff about algorithmic reasoning and capturing computation that didn't get covered today. Uh, if you want to learn more or a detailed list of references, we have a three hour long tutorial at log 22, which covers uh, all of the bases and also has code samples, references, uh, and slides. So that's an algo reasoning.github.io. If you come from a combinatorial optimization perspective and you're interested in more like MP hard problems using these kinds of methods, we have a 61 page survey on GNNs for CO, which was published in JMLR last year. And section 3.3 specifically deals with uh, these algorithmic reasoning setups that we talked about today. And the idea of removing these group constraints towards monoids is actually a hint at a much richer picture, which uses category theory and its foundations. We recently wrote a full paper outlining this picture, and you can find it at categoricaldeeplearning.com. Feedback is very much welcome. And as a bonus, we can actually rediscover all of these one co-cycle conditions using the gadgets that CDL uh, prescribes. You can see this in the appendix of our paper. Or as brilliantly phrased by Michael Galkin, there might always be a more general theory, but categorical deep learning seems to be the most general of them all so far. It is definitely generic enough to eat previous approaches like graph neural networks or geometric deep learning for breakfast. That was my last slide. Thank you very much for bearing with me, and I hope you enjoyed it. And I'm happy to take any questions if you might have yeah. one. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions or comments? Well, there have been a lot of mathematics that you described at the last part of the talk, but I'm interested actually in the mathematics of the algorithmic alignment that does uh, dynamical programming. That was very early stage of your talk. Yes, okay, so what would you like to know about that mathematics? Well, how, how the magic of the alignment works. Right, so basically, uh, so I did have a different set of slides where I talk step-by-step step into a sketch of how the authors are able to prove this alignment leads to better generalization, but the general assumption that they're going for, uh, the, the, the result does rely on a few of assumptions. It assumes that some of the functions are, uh, are well-behaved, so some level of Lipschitz continuity, it also assumes that uh, uh, the uh, behavior of the model is consistent with respect to different resamplings. So once you choose a distribution across different samples of the same distribution, you, you're not expecting drastically different behaviors. And they quantify that as well. And for some of the proofs they have around uh, linear alignment specifically, they assume that you're working in this uh, neural tangent kernel regime. So they assume the neural network is infinitely wide and that the uh, gradient descent steps uh, taken are infinitesimal. Also, uh, they have this uh, assumption that, uh, uh, that basically, uh, you have uh, yeah, so the neural tangent kernel regime. That's uh, uh, that's that's basically our, and yeah, the whole framework is a uh, pack based. So basically, probably approximately correct. They they are able to make proofs of the claim with probability at least uh, uh, delta. Uh, well, one minus delta. I can. And, uh, have that my error is going to be epsilon or smaller. So they're, they're able to make those kinds of claims for algorithmic alignment. And this, the, the TLDR of the main result they're able to show under those assumptions is that if you can uh, break apart your model into pieces such that uh, the individual pieces are learnable with error epsilon, uh, 
you can learn the whole function with big O of epsilon. So basically, for the same number of samples, you'll get a strictly smaller uh, generalization error, uh, strictly smaller or equal generalization error with this, uh, the same number of samples if you have an, an architecture that can be broken down into pieces and match them with your target algorithm as opposed to having just a generic unaligned architecture. So that was a whirlwind tour of what the math is about. Obviously, like you can get more insight if you read the papers, but this is Absolutely. how it works. Absolutely, but the computational challenge of dynamical programming is solved by your approach? Uh, so what do you mean by computational challenge? We it's always- like a CPU, it's CPU cumbersome, especially in high dimension, but dynamical programming is known to work, but it's not so efficient computationally. Uh, so basically we are focused on algorithms that are polynomial in the input size. So we do not consider dynamic program. So, okay, basically if your dynamic programming approach is used to solve a problem, which is MP hard, like knapsack or something like that. Well, for knapsack, you have quasi-polynomial solutions. But basically, uh, this is not the panacea. If dynamic programming doesn't have an efficient solution for your problem, then the GNN will not be able to do it either. And actually, in the original algorithmic alignment problem, they looked at the subset sums task for which they to make it aligned with the dynamic programming. They had to build uh, basically an exponential time architecture that enumerates subsets of a certain size. Right, so it doesn't fix the problems of the computational complexity really. It just aligns them to that complexity. But there's lots of more instances where dynamic programming offers an efficient solution. That's great. Thank you very much. No worries. All right. Thanks. Any other questions? All right. Seems enough. Yeah. Thank you very much. And uh, thanks again. I'm looking forward to uh, seeing you next week then for the what to the audience. Yeah, thank you, Peter. Thank you. Thanks again for having me. Yeah, yeah thanks. Take care. Thanks. Bye.